All right, what's up, Price Bow Nation and Nutribio Bio Crew? This is Mike Roberto and Ben Kane with Price Bow, and we are here with Master Mark Glazier, founder and CEO of Nutribio. The last time I was in this office, it was a whole lot different. We, that was 2016. Today's August 12th of 2019, and there have been so many changes. You guys have done so many things. You're featuring on your screens. You have products that didn't exist back then, or flavors that didn't exist back then. So first off, congratulations on all your success. Thank you. And um, I wanted in this in this interview, I wanted to talk a little bit about what's happened in the past. But recently, you're posting on Facebook. You guys underwent what seemed to be a pretty brutal audit from the FDA. And I wanted to kind of understand the process there. I, I know you've told me that you don't really like pass an audit, but I think there's like possibly ways that other places can maybe fail an audit or get or get reprimanded or whatever. So I kind of I'd like to understand what happens during an FDA audit and how did that just like uproot your life and how intense was this because it sounded like it was more extreme and in the past the last time we were here we we interviewed um and we talked about their supplement regulations and how there are tons of them mm -hmm. and you kind of talked about one of these audits and then you know it came back so yeah well to start with what you said so nobody's confused you do not pass an audit you don't get certified by the fda mm -hmm. uh they they don't walk out of here and you know, if you get in trouble, you get a 483, you get an observance, you get a warning letter, you get a fine, you get closed down. If everything is clean, they walk out and it's just like a audit by the IRS. They don't pat you in the back and they just leave. So right. I don't want anything to sound like there was a pass, fail, or certification. Uh, but yeah, they showed up on April Fool's Day. I was on my way, to, I was, I'm not joking. The second time, we've had five audits under CFR 111. The first time they showed up on April Fool's Day, and they came in, my office was right here, they said, yeah, the FDA's here, and I knew it was April Fool's. I was literally about to shout out to the whole facility, tell them to get, I'm not in the mood, and then I thought to myself, you know what, there's a slight chance. Mm -hmm. So I walked out there and the FDA was here, and ended up they didn't audit us on that one because we were just building the facility. But think of like lightning strikes twice, they literally showed up April Fool's morning. I had to cancel oh, my trip to Germany, and I thought, okay, that was I thought Dan was messing with me. I'm like, okay, this can never happen twice. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, Dan, you know. so I was about to scream out again and joke around, and I said, you know what, I better check again. And there they were, three weeks. How many people? One this time. So we've had five, I think, total of five under CFR 111. We actually had one under CFR 211 pharmaceutical one time. Uh, we've had we had one investigate one audit with three people that were here for uh, two weeks. One with two people, one with one person. This was one person, but it was it, was, it spanned three weeks, and it was the most intense and vicious we've had by far. Wow! Which it just shows the FDA when they first started. You know, you're getting pharmaceutical inspectors, and they really didn't know what to do with CFR 111, so they're a little easier now. These inspectors come in; they know everything. This woman who came in, she knew every part of CFR 111. She wasn't guessing at anything. She had her schedule down, and she was tough. Really. So what, what's the first thing that happens? Like, do they give you an official credential, or they say, like, you have to get the official you are being audited letter? How does that even Yeah, happen? you come in, they'll sit you down, they give you a letter, uh, and you sign off on it. Mm -hmm. The first time they ever did it was interesting. They came in, and they asked us if we uh, ever buy or sell anything outside of New Jersey. And we're like, yeah, and we showed them a receipt, I think of a staple shipping something. Mm -hmm. And they, they said, well, by the uh, Commerce Act, the FDA is now allowed to be in here. Right. Because the Constitution doesn't allow anything that's not in the Constitution. The Commerce Act allows interstate trade for now the government to come in. So it's kind of a strange thing for me. So if you actually were... enacted the Commerce Act to be able to come into my facility. Yeah, so if you had only done business in New Jersey and nowhere else in the world, country yeah. or anything, FDA wouldn't be able to... Technically, they're not allowed in because the, the Constitution doesn't allow the federal government to do anything unless the con it's written into the Constitution. The Commerce Act you know, brings in interstate, but it's impossible. It means you didn't buy anything in this whole oh, facility. Right, yeah. Not a single thing, not a cabinet, a piece of carpet, anything. Anything I purchased anywhere in the outside of New Jersey would, would enact the Commerce Act. Gotcha. It's just a, a funny little detail. But yeah, they come in, you sign a piece of paper, they give you a copy of it. First thing they usually always do is just walk right after a tour. You know, they want to see what's going on spur of the moment. And there's nothing you can really do. I mean, I can scream out there and say, FDA, clean up. <laughs> but, you know, it's a three-week audit. All they can do really quickly is sweep some floors or something. That you can't hide anything right. because it's such an intensive audit mm -hmm. that they're going to find everything. But they just want to do that quick walkthrough. So we spend an hour or so just walking through the whole facility. And I, and I think it's more for them to get away of the land quickly of what's going on because then you'll do another five, ten times going through the facility as they mm -hmm. look at stuff. So that's the first part. Uh, we talk for half hour, an hour, going over what they're going to do, and then hammer time starts. And what, what is hammer time? Uh, 
hammer time is uh, usually they'll still ask for a list of our batch production records since the last time they were here. Okay. And that'll just be a log of every batch we've ever made. Is that and just binders and binders of... No, it was just a report. Oh, okay. And then she'll randomly pick uh, as many batches as they want to see. And sometimes we it's 30 or 40 batches. We've had inspections where they picked over 100 batches a stack as tall. Depending on the investigator, they want to see everything associated with that production. Okay, so the batch record, production batch production record tells you every aspect of the build of that product. It's like the formula recipe of every room we went in, of every process, of every ingredient, of everything. But they also want to see all the backup. So okay, well, let's say it's a uh, intra, and you have twenty some odd ingredients there. They want to see all of the C of A's and all the documents and all the paperwork for every single one of those ingredients, all of the identity testing for every one of those ingredients, all the testing, because CFR 111 requires you to do testing of raw ingredients for purity, potency, composition, and identity, all the testing for that. They'll want to see maintenance logs for all the machines. They'll want to see SOP, standard operating procedures, for any employee that was involved in that uh, and just on and on and on. So now, you, and they ask for that right up front because it could take a day or so to be, you know, you have so many of them mm -hmm. to gather reports from the lab. You have to get all the lab, then whatever equipment was used in the lab, they'll want to see the documentation on the lab equipment and, and stuff like that. If scales were used, they want to see the scale logs and the validation that we do to use that scale and the third party validation that comes in. Uh, and it just goes on and on. So you're, why there are going on for the first couple of days, you're still collecting and putting more and more of these batch records together. Wow. And uh, they go through them with it. For us, anyway, I, I don't know what happens in different parts of the country. Right. I hear people, you know, say they got audited and they ran it out in three days and this, that, and the other thing. I hear people all the time say, oh yeah, they're were, they were in here for a couple of days, we passed, they gave us a certification. I'm like, yeah, that's some bullshit. Uh, but then we'll, they will, <laughs> we set them up in their own room. Mm -hmm. Okay, It's very strict. You're not allowed to offer them anything. Uh, if anybody has a certification from the outside, you can't show that to them. They will push it right off because there's no outside certification. NSF, UL, or any of those that matter to them, they don't want to see that, so you're not, you know, not allowed to show it to them. And they'll set up camp in the room that you put them in, and then they go to work. And the whole company is on call. We still operate, so it doesn't really affect operations. But the whole company is on call until they leave to show documents and give explanations straight through. Right, were there any products they focused on, like the stuff with stimulants, or was it more random, it seemed like? No, no, but the, the first thing they do focus on is they review your last audit. And if there are any issues in your last audit, they'll want to see immediately what was yeah. in that last audit before mm -hmm. they start going on, and then they continue with their regular audit. Uh, but no, we, they didn't look for any specific, uh, one of our audits, they went heavily into herbs, and I think it was because there's a big issue in the herb you know, market back then, but this time they weren't looking for DMA. We've never used that, so right. they weren't looking for anything specific to that. Gotcha. Uh -huh. Tom, you had a question or something? Or? Uh, so if they look at your last audit, they're looking to see if you rectified the, anything, like you got a 483 on anything. They yeah, well, even if you had a 483, you had to... Explain what a 483 is. A 483 is an observance. So, I mean, if you do something really bad, you're going to get a warning letter, and that warning letter is like... That's, you, you know, that's industry work, news if you get yeah, a real warning letter. Like. Right, you're, you're going to get closed up, something's going to happen, you got to... You know, you can get fined, you can have all things. A 43 is called an observance. And they see uh, maybe something's broken in one room and there's a hole in the wall and bacteria or dust can get through. They might give you a 483 saying you're not protecting from cross-contamination right. because that room had a door broken or something like that. And usually they'll give you six weeks or so to correct those observances. You correct them, you create a new SOP or retrain the people and you turn that into them and then they will answer with the final document. The final document, uh, I forgot what it's called, it's all the top of my mind, but it's usually about this thick. Really? And the first time I got one, I was like, okay, they left, no big deal, and I get the document, I'm reading through it, and it's everything. If they lifted that ceiling tile mm -hmm. and put their finger up there for dust, it's written there. Uh, third ceiling tile, X room, so-and-so lifted for, I mean, I, it's unbelievable, the details. So you think, oh, they didn't notice any of this stuff. They notice it all, they write it all down, mm -hmm. and you get to see that document. It's really cool because then you can go over that with your entire staff and say, okay, you know, they noticed this here, let's see if we can clean that up. So it's a learning process for, for everybody, I think. Okay, so when it's all done, they just can't do that and they walk out, there's no... Oh no, I mean, it's a long process. Uh, yeah. Just uh, sitting down with the, the uh, batch production records, you can be sitting there for two hours with one of those records answering questions and stuff. On this particular order, it was really wild, they asked for, all the sanitation logs for the machines and the different clean rooms since the last time they were here. So the log will show time in, time out, how long it took to clean and sanitize the room. Mm -hmm. And they actually didn't scan it. 
They spent over a day going log by log on every single room, calculating the time for the sanitation and the end time, how long it took, comparing it to the average of that particular piece of machinery or a room, and then flagging anything that might have been above or below a standard deviation. I was like, holy crap. And then so, we have to answer the specifics of, well, that's normally 28 minutes. Why did it take you only 12 minutes to do that? And we'd have to answer to it. And there was always a reason of what we did. It might have been a... We uh, put, put a product in a room, or we're supposed to put a product in a room, creatine monohydrate for bottling, mm -hmm. and decided against it. We did, canceled it out. So when the next product came in, we didn't have to resanitize because it never came in. But the log might not have shown that we canceled it. So you might have to put an explanation or something in there. Or, you know, something simple like that. But we had to explain any single one of those. And if she found a number of those that were not explainable, we probably would have got a 483 for not having sanitized our equipment properly. So because of that, did you change a couple of your procedures here to like just make things better and better? So next time, yeah, we change one thing is when a product is not going when we set a product going into a room and it goes into the log, it's getting ready to be sanitized. If it doesn't go in the room, they've got to actually put the straight line through it and put the reason why the product didn't go in the room. Mm -hmm. And this way, next time somebody looks at it, the explanation will be right there. We don't have to figure it out. So yeah, I mean you're learning stuff like this all the time yeah. to make it easy. There was no break in CFR one eleven on that. It was just a notation issue. Right, so when they're when they're looking at like the amount of time that something takes, I'm almost thinking like they're checking for the, the opposite. If something is running a little extra long than lately, are they trying to, not trying to catch, but are they maybe occasionally from other places catching when someone sneaks in an extra run of something else? Like, yeah, can you have I any guesses? Know. They... I, I would, you know, I don't know if it's that deviant in that way. I think the idea is you have to have a process, and that process has right. to be identical every single time. And that's what makes a finished product, and the FDA knows that. So if you have all these SOPs, all these standard operating procedures, here they are. I don't know if the camera can see them from that angle. No. No, but here they look like like this, and I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of these books and all these procedures. Every procedure in the company is written down in one of these books. It's date stamped, it's revision numbers. If we change any procedure, we have to come up with a new procedure, restamp it. QA, QC management has to sign off on it. And every employee in the company that has any involvement in that SOP has to be trained in that SOP. They have to have a training log signed and then has an expiration for how long they're allowed to do that operation. So the, the, yes, the FDA is looking for those SOPs. That's another thing they'll pull right up front is all of your SOPs because they want to see that there are procedures done for everything. If there are, then it's a repeatable process. Mm -hmm. And if everything's being done, then the end product should be the same every time. So I think when they're looking through all these logs, they're looking to see, are you actually doing your SOPs? Okay, I see the SOP, the SOP passes what we want you to do, that's good, but are you really doing it? They're trying to find any deviation, like uh, you say you're doing it, but you're really not. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I guess if, uh, you know, when they first come into the office, you're allowed to ask them, and they have to answer, is this just a standard FDA audit, or is there a complaint? And they, by, by regulation, by law, have to answer you. So everyone we've ever had has not been by a complaint, it's just been their normal standard audit. I guess if they had a complaint and they were coming in for that purpose, they would have a whole different mindset more in line with what you're doing. Gotcha. Yeah. I but see. I think in general that's what they're looking for. Do you have the SOPs, the SOPs up to the standards of CFR 111, and are the processes actually being done, or do you just have a book in the back saying you're doing it? Mm -hmm. And that's what they're really spending all that time looking for. Right, now as a consumer, it, and what I like about here, and I've said this a million times, I know we're Nutribio stuff's getting manufactured. If I did know where another brand was manufacturing something, am I able, as a consumer, as an American citizen, am I able to request from the government you know, all the audit logs of these other contract manufacturers out there? Like, is this public record? Do I have to like file an FOIA or something like that? Some of it is know? public record, but I guess the Freedom of Information, you can probably get some. So I have to like basically sue for that, but uh, it's yeah, not. You probably but this audit result is not just posted on FDA.gov somewhere. No. Right. No. Okay. Uh, like the warning, warning letters, letters are. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So right. we've all seen those warning letters come out, and we get every single warning letter that comes in, and we review every single warning letter. And if it's something that we think that uh, is pertinent to what we're doing here, where our teams will come in because we want to see sometimes you're doing something. It's a, it's a learning process. Yeah. You know? This whole thing about quality manufacturing, you know, there is no perfection in it. You're learning and you're trying. For for us, the concept is. We're trying to be perfect, so it's a pursuit of that perfection. So we're always learning and doing and improving. Like this whole build out right now, they finished this uh, <clears throat> three-week audit. We had a scheduled renovation here. About a month later, we gutted this whole place and mm -hmm. we ripped it to shreds. And all of a sudden, you know, social media, Glazier must have gotten in trouble. He talks a big story, but they had an audit in there. Now he's ripping the place apart. No, no, no. We, we not a single 43. We were clean. Mm -hmm. But we had scheduled because we're not manufacturing here to the standard of government regulators. 
makers. We're manufacturing to the standard of our customer. We want to be ahead of the curve, ahead of the ball. And we took this whole facility, we gutted it. So we, we yeah. didn't do it by, de people say things are done by desperation or inspiration. We didn't redo the facility out of desperation because somebody was telling you this by inspiration. If you guys have been on BioCool, Ben had a big part in starting BioCool. Mm -hmm. You just go on that page and you look at the people who are following your product and talking about your product and working with each other and helping each other. And you're like, you read the stories that they're telling every day. You've seen it. I mean, it's incredible. You get inspired, you know? So if I'm making a product, it's like, holy shit, I can't let these people down, you know, yeah. because they're trusting me. And that's something I take very important. So we gutted this whole facility. We cut, they said, a quarter mile of sheetrock, the first two feet of a, the entire facility down, not including new rooms we built, really? just to look inside of our walls before we put new floors and stuff down to make sure there's no bacteria inside the walls. We, all the way through, we put all new sheetrock on the walls. We uh, epoxied the walls. We put epoxy coving, five layers of port epoxy. It cost me 180,000 grand wow. just for that epoxy on the floors, and not just to have shiny floors, so, but to make sure that it was seamless. There's no way bugs can crawl through walls or bacteria right. can get into the wall or moisture from the floors can get underneath and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So when we, we rebuilt this, we took, it, was, it wasn't an expansion. We didn't end up with more space. It just was taking everything to a new level. You know, facility ages, so you always want to, you know, you don't want to wait till it's totally decrepit, you want to keep it up to date. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a, everything, cafeterias, labs, my office, everything just totally gutted and started over. And we're really proud, that's why we opened it this weekend for tours. Yeah. Let everybody come in and now we're getting attacked because there's pictures on the internet of us walking through without masks and stuff like that. But the company, it wasn't open up yet for GMP. Right. So we wanted everybody to come in. We opened it to the whole public and we just walked through the different processes. We did like we did with you today where we opened up a, uh, uh, encapsulate room and they're running maltodextrin on it and uh -huh. they toss the capsules out and we just had a lot of fun with it. Mm -hmm. And, and I, we appreciate that. I, I know it's, it public, takes extra work to, to yeah. do that extra stuff, but it was kind of cool to actually be in the encapsulation room and yeah. watch our little fake Malto get made that and everything. Was so and it was cool for me. Like yesterday, we had the party. I didn't even. I wasn't even the barbecue of the party. I was right. giving tours one after another all day long. But the tours weren't okay. Here's our shiny equipment. Here's a bunch of bells and whistles going off. It was an educational tour, and people left here. They understood CFR 111. They understood the Shea. They understood what quality from manufacturing was. It was probably more boring to them because I was talking a lot, like when we go through. But I I wanted them to leave not saying, wow, that's really cool. Do you see all that stainless steel shiny stuff? No, I wanted them to leave here knowing what to expect in a product that's coming from my facility. Yeah, absolutely. And you could tell people were wowed about it. And the Nutribio consumer, we've kind of grown to expect that kind of stuff. I mean, and you've educated us with so much stuff that we always just want to go to the next level. So for the people who, who haven't, you know, weren't able to make it to the Bio Crew Barbecue Bash and, and see you do it in person, we do have a, we did a recording that we're going to be posting on YouTube as well. So we'll, we'll be linking to that, what we're talking about, the maltodextrin capsules and everything. But it's, it, it's almost like you've put yourself to such a high standard that you gotta, you gotta maintain or exceed that. And that's kind of what we expect is we want to see these, these types of, you know, the extra information. Mm -hmm. Does every consumer need to see that? No, of course not. But the Nutribio consumer who's really gotten deep into the bio crew, they love that. So we definitely yeah, appreciate well, it. It's interesting. Somebody looked at a picture and posted, and I think, you, Ben, I think brought it to our attention where they were kind of attacking us because we didn't have our masks down and stuff on in there. But the facility was not in GMP mode. It was just in a tour right. room. We hadn't opened yet. But I wasn't upset with the person who did that. I thought it was great. Somebody noticed that, questioned it. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need. I answered those questions and everybody understood. Mm -hmm. This industry needs to be questioned. Yeah. Companies need to be questioned. Let them answer. If they don't want to answer, then there might be a problem. But I, I enjoyed that interaction that I had with this gentleman. And the people who got involved were very educated. Everybody just jumped on and said, oh, he has buttons instead of snaps. Well, no, we had snaps that just couldn't tell in the picture. And it went through all this stuff. <laughs> now I'm looking at it and huh, do we have that? Oh, yeah, we do, we do, we do. It was just a bunch of smart people who really cared talking about whether this facility was really GMP or not. And I got in there. Luckily, I found out. We answered everything. Uh, so I think that's cool. I think these people need education. Not everybody gives a damn. No, the average person is not looking at labels and proprietary blends and protein spiking and calculations and stuff like that. But in general, we need to do that for those people who are because they're the ones who recommend and spread everything about the same. Exactly. That's things. the person you ask. Yeah. yeah, and it's like more and more people are realizing that there's too much mystery over our food supply and, and supplements and everything. And it's like, well, some people want to know exactly what farm their food was grown at or where those chicken eggs were or where that beef, where that cattle actually grazed. Like mm -hmm. that's becoming more and more important because we've 
grown to this level of distrust seeing all the health issues that happen. So like that's where NutriBio is so well positioned in the supplement industry because you have been open with that like since the beginning. And mm-hmm. we will link back to the NutriBio story where you told us all about how this all began and you know, you threw out everything way back in the day and realized I gotta do this myself. And mm-hmm. we really appreciate that you not only just opening up the formulas and showing us how much sucralose is in the new protein powder, but we also in, you know, really appreciate you opening up the the floor for us, mm-hmm. going in, you know, going into non mega production mode and letting us see some of this stuff because that's the only video we have of it. Yeah, but, well, but you know, it's not just for this weekend that we do it. Our facility is always open for anybody to come in. We can't always give a full tour right. depending on what's on the floor, but we've created viewing rooms and viewing areas now so people can walk through. Mm-hmm. And if anybody in the industry ever wants and they call us in advance, we'll give them a, a, a full tour. Mm-hmm. It might not be as intense as yours because they're not allowed into those rooms because they're in production. Today right. we're in production, so we're allowed to take in and see stuff. But you know, we have, we have full transparency. We want everybody to see what we're doing, uh, criticize it, and, help us get better or love it and pass it on. There we go. Well, thank you. Mark, once again, so, so much, very much appreciated. Uh, love everything you're doing for the industry. And I think that's going to lead into the next video, which we'll just tease and we'll start a new one. But um, I almost feel like you have accomplished so much of your mission that you have almost won in a way by when I first got into this, it was so much more of a mess. And I, I keep thinking like the person who's been pushing things along has been Mark Laser. So subscribe to the channel, check out price.com slash NutriBio because I got another one for you. And uh, we'll link back to the plant tour and everything else that's happened this weekend. There's gonna be a lot of content on this channel. Anything else to say, Ben? I, I mean, in this information age, like there are consumers that are so excited just to listen to all of this. I know that sometimes we talk about how like not everyone wants to hear this, but I think this kind of stuff is exactly what a lot of people want to hear. And, and putting it out there is it's just it's powerful for people to be able to hear it. So thanks so much. All right. Yeah, and by the way, questions. Ben's been was here for years. He could probably, <laughs> That's he could probably give this this tour all by himself. <laughs> I could have taken off. I was dead tired. You could. I was joking yesterday. yesterday. If you got tired, I could help you. Yeah, I was probably could have done the whole thing. I think like other than except for the new stuff that we just did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Hey, Mike. Thanks as always. I oh, appreciate yeah, sorry. it. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Man. Thank you.